BIM is a business process model simulator. It allows you to simulate BPMN process models in a few clicks. All you have to do is to drag and drop a BPMN process model into the BIM's web interface and to enter the simulation parameters in a simple web form. Once you have done that, you can simulate and obtain a number of statistics and histograms. I am going to demonstrate how BIMP works using an example of a credit application handling process shown here. So you take uh, your scenario, in this case it will be uh, the credit application scenario, your, your BPMN file, and you throw it into BIMP. And you start specifying the parameters. In this case, I already pre-populated as well. And you have to specify every how often you get new uh, credit applications. In this case, I'm saying that I receive one every 30 minutes and that it follows an exponential distribution, meaning it's a Poisson process. Then I can specify how many how many credit applications I will simulate, meaning how many case instances of the process I will simulate. And here you have to pick a number that corresponds to a reasonably long period of time so that you can observe different variations. Let's say at least more than a week, two weeks. So I'm, I'm saying here 500 applications, which means uh, you see that there are 16 applications per day. So 500 applications corresponds to something like uh, 32 full working days of work. So it's quite significant. Um, the starting time of the simulation is not very relevant. Uh, I can put whatever I want here. Um, just for fun, I'll put uh, something like 9 o'clock on a given day. Right. Currency is not important, but I mean, except if you care about it. Uh, then you have to define your resource pools. I define in this case a, a resource pool clerk, and there are three resources of this type and their cost per hour is 25, that's what I'm assuming. And I have to say with respect to which timetable they work. I'm going to explain the notion of timetable in a minute. Then you have to, uh, I have a second role, which is the role of the decision maker, which is called a, a credit officer. And there are three resources who play that role, and they cost 50 an hour. And I add, uh, for my automated task, I add a third resource called assistant. And I'll say that there is uh, one of them. It turns out is sufficient in here. But if you want, you can throw in more so that no queues <coughs> build up in the system. You don't want the system to be interfering with your waiting times. So you, if necessary, put in a lot of resources of type system so that you there's never waiting times for the system, which is what we want to, to capture. Uh, and the cost per hour of the system, of course, is not important. I just put any random number in there. Um, and then I can define timetables. There is one timetable that comes by default in BIMP, which is uh, uh, very creatively called default. Uh, and you can change the values of it. So in this, by, by default, the default timetables comes Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 17. But I, I can change it. I can, I can put 18 here if I want, right? There's no problem. I'll leave it at 17. The default timetable is important because this is that timetable that is going to be used for the creation of cases, meaning new cases are only going to be created during the default timetable, which means from Monday to Friday, in this case, from 9 a.m. to 17, right? And I can change that if I want. I can say that cases arrive at any time, even in the, during the night, or I can say that cases only arrive during business hours, etc. And you can create other timetables, which I am not going to do here, because the default timetable will suffice to me, because the for every resource, I have to specify a timetable. And in this case, it turns out that the clerk and the credit officer both work also from Monday to Friday, from 9 to 17, 17, which is business hours. So I do not need to specify a separate timetable for them. I will reuse the default timetable. So I will write that uh, the clerk works during the default timetable, the credit officer works during the default timetable, and by the same token, the system, which in this process is responsible for receiving the loan applications, will also work during the resource timetable. Then for every task, I have to specify which resource pool performs it. So the check credit history is performed by the clerk, check income sources by the clerk, 
receiving the customer feedback, which is an automated task, is instant, is performed by the system, and uh, a notify rejection by the credit officer, assess application by the credit officer, and make credit offers by the credit officer. Then for every task, I have to specify the duration. I have to pick. Is it fixed, meaning that it always takes exactly 10 minutes, for example? That's very rarely the case, but, you know, it might be you'll find a scenario where that is the case. Who knows? More often than not, it will be either a normal distribution if uh, your task is very mechanic, which is what I am assuming of checking the credit history. You go to a database, you do a search, you find the credit history, you attach it to a case. It's very mechanic. So I'll say it follows a normal distribution. Then I have to specify the mean uh, and the standard deviation and in minutes and the, the time unit I am using it. So I'm going to say that checking the credit history takes 10 minutes with a standard deviation of about 2 minutes. And something similar for check income source, I would say it's a normal distribution with mean of 20 and standard deviation of 4. Receive customer feedback is an automated task. I would say that it takes 0 seconds. Well, if you leave empty the field, it means 0. Uh, and I'm going to say it's fixed. It always takes 0 seconds right? to receive it, the actual receipt. Not to wait for it, but to receive it. So I'm, I'm assuming that customers, if they have to send feedback, they will send the feedback immediately. I don't have to assume that. I can say that, well, customers send feedbacks and it takes 10 minutes or something like that. But then uh, I have to make sure that I create more system resources to handle that so that there's no waiting times for the system. And notify rejection uh, mm -hmm. is a normal distribution. You know, it's a relatively standard task. Uh, Make credit officer, no, assess application. That, on the other hand, is a high-risk, complex decision-making task. So more likely, it will not follow a normal distribution. Thus, I will assume that it follows an exponential distribution with a mean of 20 minutes, which means some loan applications are very straightforward and can be assessed in, let's say, a few minutes to 30 minutes. But some of them might be relatively complicated because the credit history is not quite right and it might take me one hour or two hours to assess it. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty much uh, it. I mean, uh, make credit offer. And then in the XOR splits in my model, I will have to uh, say uh, for each of the branches, what is their branching probability? In this case, rejection happens in 20% of the cases and making the credit officer, the credit offer happens the acceptance happens in 80% of the cases. These two obviously have to add to 100. Uh, and there is a small trick in BIMP is that to, to be able to specify which arc out of an XOR split, which one is which, it tells you what is the next element in the model. When the next element in the model is an XOR, is another gateway, and gateways don't have a name, uh, then we are a little bit in trouble. So that's the limitation of BIMP. BIMP will tell you that he doesn't know what the name of the element that follows the XOR is. Why? Because uh, we are talking about this XOR, and this XOR is followed by another XOR here, and another XOR here. Um, so then you have to figure out in your model which one comes first. It turns out, I think, that this one, the one where you go to the end, uh, is an 80%, uh, is this one, and the other one is a 20%. So that's a limitation in BIMP that. Sometimes you have to guess which branch is which one. Because it kind of always looks, only tells you what the next element after that, the flow is. And then you have to guess. You have an option in Beam to generate a full log in a format called MXML, which you will be able to import into a tool called PROM that we will only introduce later. So I'm not going to go into these details. This will generate the full log, and you can analyze it in lots of details if you use Pro. But I'm not going to generate the MXML log. If you do it, it actually takes more time to simulate because of all the logging issues. I would just I just want to get the statistics. Um, there is an option in BIMP to, if I have spent 10 minutes or 20 minutes entering this data, I kind of want to save it. In addition, this way I can send it to somebody else. So if you have entered all the data, like now, you can click on Save Scenario and that will uh, produce a .bpmn file, which is here, that already has all the simulation parameters you entered. 
so you don't have to re-enter the simulation parameters next time. Okay? And that way you can send it to somebody else and that person can throw that model into BIMP and see all the simulation parameters that you use and therefore reproduce your simulation. And I, I start the simulation. And this was very straightforward, so it comes up very quick. And I get uh, the, the histogram of my cycle times, the average cycle time, uh, the histogram of the waiting time. You see that the waiting times in this process are not very bad, uh, usually more like in the area of seven minutes or less. The cost of every process instance, this is the histogram, so this means that 150 instances, for example, took between 27 and 37 euros of uh, labor cost to process them. Processing labor costs. Yeah. Or, and for 138 of them, another 138 of them, it took between 17 and 27 euros to, of labor cost. And I know that because for every resource I have the cost per hour, and every time I assign the task to a resource, and it takes a certain amount of time to be performed, I can calculate how much labor it consumed, and therefore how much labor cost it took. And I can add up that for a given process instance and find out what is the uh, labor cost of a given process instance. And then one thing that I find very important is the resource utilization. So in this case, it tells you that the clerk is occupied 34% of their, of their time, their occupancy rate is 34%, and the credit officer 35%, which means that the occupancy rate in this scenario is very low. And that explains why my waiting times are extremely small. The, the sum of the waiting times of all the tasks in a given process for 418 out of the 500 process instances was l basically less than seven minutes, which means we are waiting almost no, never. And then there are some additional statistics at the, at the bottom that you, you can make use of it. And I can go back. Um, I can say, what if now I start receiving every 20 minutes, meaning three an hour, which means 24 a day, right? What do you think will happen? The waiting times will be longer. Resource utilization will be higher. So yeah, resource utilization jumped to around 50%, right? And then we start seeing a bit higher uh, waiting times. You remember it used to be that uh, 418 were below seven minutes. Now it's like more like nine minutes, actually closer to 10 minutes in those terms. So it's increasing by the little. And just to, to tell you, to give you an idea of uh, how much uh, what does it mean to have a very high utilization rate? I'm going to make them arrive every 10 minutes. So. so now if I go and check the, the resource utilization, now I have 92% resource utilization for my credit officer. That's, the, that's very close to a tough bottleneck. There's a bottleneck there. And my waiting times are now in the order of, waiting times are in the order of hours. You know, the peak of the histogram is in the 1.4 hours to 2.7 hours.